Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, many thanks for the invitation. I feel uh, distinguished, indeed, to be here in this great <laughs> center. So uh, today I'm going to talk about some of the work we have been uh, done uh, on music and movement at our lab. The title is uh, Kinematics of Music Cognition. It's maybe a bit too broad. I'm mostly focusing on music-induced movement and uh, various aspects uh, thereof. Uh, <clears throat> let's <clears throat> start by looking at a video clip with some spontaneous movement to rhythm. <laughs> so this is from uh, an infant study we did on, on uh, music induced movement and as you can see there's like almost a a hardwired connection between the drum pulse and the infant's, infant's movement. And um, I guess we all uh, often notice that uh, when we listen to music, especially music with a strong rhythmic element, uh, it makes us move and often it's, it's uh, even difficult to avoid the movement. And uh, uh, well, what we, we found in that infant study was, was that uh, the, um, our participants uh, showed significantly more uh, movement when they, pre when they were presented with uh, music or rhythmic patterns as, as with speech. So, so the conclusion was that there is some kind of predisposition for rhythmic movement in response to music. Uh, according to self-reports, uh, a great major majority of us move when we move to music. Music has uh, been found to make us to, to walk faster, and, and so on. Now, uh, in a broader framework, uh, there are some uh, theoretical accounts that may give explanations for the importance of movement in music processing. For instance, um, the embodied view of cognition uh, states that uh, all aspects of cognition are shaped by the aspects of the body. In other words, our sensory motor cap capacities, body and environment, play a role in cognitive processing. Uh, so according to this view, uh, perception is not a um, mere passive retrieval, but it's an active construction which is based on uh, an organism's uh, embodied uh, goal-directed goal actions. <clears throat> the common coding theory, on the other hand, uh, states that perceptual and motor representations are linked and uh, support to this uh, uh, comes from, for instance, uh, infants' innate imitation capabilities. They can uh, immediately imitate, for instance, a protruding tongue, a wide open mou mouth, or mimic expressions of um, different emotions such as happiness, sadness, and, and uh, surprise. Um, <clears throat> As regards music, it has been found that uh, a regular beat <coughs> excuse me, uh, evokes activity in, in the motor areas of the brain. Uh, this had, has been found uh, by several researchers, uh, including uh, Jessica Grant, who found uh, that uh, several motor-related areas, such as basal ganglia, supplementary motor area, and dorsal premotor area were activated uh, when participants were presented with a regular, regular uh, rhythmical beats. And this finding has been found in, in um, several studies uh, that have used uh, some kind of synthetic stimuli. Uh, we recently published um, a study where we used uh, realistic uh, music, uh, a real music, musical stimuli, uh, and investigated uh, uh, where different um, uh, music, musical features were processed in the, in the brain, and we found uh, somewhat similar findings there as well. So what we did was to present our participants with a piece of music, an Argentinian tango, and while they were listening we recorded the uh, responses using uh, fMRI. Um, then we, we 
took this um, stimulus and uh, used computer algorithms implemented in the MIR toolbox to extract, extract a set of musical features. And uh, then we performed um, correlation and regression analysis uh, between the brain responses and uh, the time courses of, of the musical features. And uh, so we were able to model the activations evoked by the musical stimulus. As regards uh, pulse, musical pulse processing, what we found uh, was that uh, there were a few uh, motor-related areas like the supplementary motor area and the putamen that were um, uh, activated uh, uh, with the processing of, of the pulse clarity of the music. So that uh, kind of um, adds to, to the knowledge on, on, uh, on the role of motor area in um, musical rhythm processing, this time with a, a realistic musical stimulus. <clears throat> okay, now we have been uh, studying uh, quite extensively uh, the way uh, adults move to the music spontaneously, and uh, let's have a look at uh, some of uh, the movement that we have uh, recorded. Okay, as you saw, uh, there was quite a variety of different kind of uh, movement styles uh, with these uh, pieces of music. And uh, now, uh, an, a question that interests us is uh, what might be the characteristics uh, that um, music-induced mov movement uh, depends on. And um, now, there are quite many, many aspects that probably have an effect on, on um, the kinematics of these kind of movements. Um, the first one is, is music characteristic, characteristics. So for instance, tempo meter, timbre, tonality and lyrics probably have, have an effect on, on how we move to music. Um, another aspect is the characteristics of the listener. Things like the personality, mood, preference to the music, or gender. And finally, there are uh, various cultural conventions, of course, like uh, there are maybe certain dancing styles associated to certain genres and so on. And uh, so the, what comes out is, is a com very complex mixture of, of all, all these uh, things and uh, we are trying to kind of tease them apart and see what are the effects of, of these uh, different uh, uh, aspects. And now how, how do we then measure uh, or quantify uh, 
the characteristics of, of the movement. First of all, we can, we can um, have a look at the physical characteristics uh, of the movement. When we use motion capture, we, we get quantitative information about the movement, and from that we can extract various features related to the posture of, of the mover, the kinematics and kinetics uh, of the movement. Uh, another way to tackle this is to, to do perceptual tests uh, uh, and uh, let participants to, to evaluate certain uh, aspects of, of the movement from the point light displays, such as the skill, the attractiveness, and the emotion of the movement. Uh, well, what we have found is that this is quite challenging from, for many reasons. The first, first one is that we have tried to, to have a high degree of ecological validity. So we have used real musical stimuli instead of uh, artificial ones. And, uh, and of course, like music-induced movement opti optimally should be something spontaneous. And uh, now if we are doing it in a lab with uh, all these markers and, and people around, then for some people it might be difficult to move spontaneously while everyone is watching. So. And uh, I'm sure there's personality plays, plays a role there. Uh, then from the point of view of data analysis, uh, the data that we get, get is, is uh, highly dimensional. So it has to be reduced somehow. It's often very non-stationary, so, so um, the dancers change their movement patterns while, while dancing, so that adds another complication, and uh, if we uh, try to connect the uh, musical uh, structure with the uh, movement structure, then finding uh, relevant features from the music is, is yet another challenge. Okay, I will uh, uh, tell about uh, four uh, different uh, studies that we have um, carried out uh, at our lab. So the first one is about how meter, musical meter is embodied in the movement. Second one is about uh, how the music movement depends on the musical characteristics. Third one, uh, its dependence on, on uh, listener characteristics. And, and finally, I will uh, tell a little bit about some uh, perceptual uh, work that we have done on music induced movement. So uh, let's start with uh, meter and uh, how it is reflected in, in music-induced movement. So what is meter? Um, music uh, has often a hierarchical structure when, when it comes to its uh, beat uh, structure. Um, so when we listen to music, we, we hear beats on, on uh, several levels, and very often they, they have like integer relationships in their periods, and, and this combination produces uh, what is called uh, um, metrical, the metrical hierarchy. Let me uh, play you a couple of uh, examples. Uh, so the first example is a duple meter. So one, two, one, two, one. Triple meter. So let's focus on the most common meter that there is, is the, the quadruple meter, 4-4 uh, meter. And um, now here we see six guys moving to a musical stimulus that has a 4-4 meter. And uh, now, now the interesting question is, are the different metrical levels somehow present in these movements? Okay. Uh, Let's look at the kinetic energy of, of the movement. So how, how do we get the kinetic energy uh, 
from this motion capture data? Well, uh, there are methods to do that. Um, they are based on body segment modeling. So the idea is that we have the, the motion capture data that tells how the joints are moving. Then we have a body segment model that uh, says something about the inertial properties of, of the segments between the joints. And then we just use some um, high school physics to calculate uh, the mechanical energy, or at least to estimate it. Of course, it's not, uh, not uh, entirely accurate because we use a generic model for the, for the kinematic properties. And of course, that uh, varies between participants. So, so we are just talking about an approximation here. OK, now that we have the, the kinetic uh, energy in the movement, we can, we can do spectral analysis on the energy. And uh, what we get is, is this kind of uh, graphs. And as you can see, in, in many of these movers, we, we see like three levels uh, of energy there. In particular, the, the one uh, on the top in the middle has, has it very clearly. So it has the quarter note level, um, half note level, and, and whole note level uh, in, the, in the energy spectrogram. For um, all of these movers, it's it's not so clear, but but the overall uh, overall pattern is there still. Now we can also uh, sonify this en energy by modulating um, uh, white noise with with this kind of uh, um, how is it called then? Well, it's amplitude modulation anyway. And so, if we listen carefully, we can listen to the three metrical levels there. It takes some practice though. Okay, anyway, that was just for fun. Um, but now the question still uh, remains uh, like, what are the uh, movement patterns that are associated with these different metrical levels? Now. That can be studied, uh, I guess, at least with two main methods. One, one is like, um, like um, <clears throat> um, using some kind of decomposition, like pr um, principal components analysis. The other one is, is uh, filtering. And uh, they produce similar kind of results, but it seems that uh, filtering, like bandpass filtering, uh, yields um, results that are kind of easier to interpret and the pattern is easier to see. So if we look at these guys here, so on the top row we have the original movement. Then we have the second row has the movement bandpass filtered at uh, a frequency corresponding to the quarter note uh, level. Third one corresponds to half note level and the lowest one uh, corresponds to whole note level. And uh, as you can see, there are some uh, common patterns, like the, the quarter note uh, level is associated with like, vertical movement, whereas uh, the half note level has more like uh, this kind of swing of limbs. And finally, the, the whole note level uh, is associated with the, the body sway. So this seems to be, of course, there's a, a large uh, variation uh, between the, the uh, dancers in that, but, uh, but that seems to be at least something, something uh, like a common pattern in uh, what we have observed. Okay. Moving on to uh, musical <laughs> characteristics. Um, um, we were interested in, for instance, how, how the beat clarity and beat strength uh, dis, uh, displays in, in the movements. Um, we did a study where we collected like uh, 15 hours of motion capture data uh, using uh, stimuli representing several genres like uh, pop, rock, blues, jazz, Latin, techno and so on. Did some uh, kinematic analysis uh, and some dimensionality reduction and uh, came up with five uh, 
main principal components in the movements and uh, performed musical feature extraction uh, on these stimuli and um, here's the list of <coughs> features that we analyzed and then performed some correlational analysis between the, the movement uh, features and the musical features. And uh, just to show a couple of our main findings, uh, pulse clarity was uh, one feature, and uh, what we found was it was with, it was uh, associated with the amount of what we call local movement, so the movement of of, of the limbs in the in the uh, of the of the subject. So uh, here is. Uh, an example of, of a stimulus with a low pulse clarity as opposed to another stimulus with a high pulse clarity. So there's a difference in the, in the amount of, uh, of the movement of the hands, uh, uh, arms and legs. Okay. Another finding was uh, associated with the uh, high low frequency flux. So it, it is about the presence or absence of, of uh, instruments such as uh, bass or bass drum and such. And uh, what we found was that if there was um, a low amount of this low frequency flux, uh, the dancers uh, tended to show large amount of global movement, so they, they were moving around as if they were searching for the beat of the music, which was not there so clear. So uh, this example is with a low uh, flux in the low frequencies, and it's more like a moving around on the dance floor, whereas uh, when there was a sturdy bass, then uh, people didn't move so much around. Okay. Uh, musical emotions are, of course, an, an essential aspect of, of music listening. And, uh, and we were interested in whether they are reflected somehow in, in the musical movement. And uh, to find out, um, we <coughs> performed uh, some, we used the same set of stimuli, performed um, a listening test where uh, participants rated the emotional content of, of the stimuli um, on these scales uh, listed on the, on the right, and uh, then compared the movement features with the emotional count. And, um, <clears throat> okay, a couple of, of uh, results we found. Activity was maybe the, the clearest of all, and, and there were quite many, <coughs> many features that, uh, that correlated <coughs> with the activity of the stimuli. Uh, those are list listed here. The, the highest correlating um, feature that we found was the fluidity, which uh, we uh, quantified as the ratio between instantaneous acceleration and instantaneous jerk. So it had, had a very high correlation with, with the activity. Here are a couple of examples. So a stimulus with low activity. So you see this fluid movement. and uh, high activity stimulus. It's more jerky, more accelerated. Well, that makes sense, of course. Okay, another emotional dimension, happiness. So the strength of happiness of the stimulus. 
And that was associated with uh, rotation. So with happy stimuli, participants tended to rotate around more. And they tended to use more complex movement. We estimated the dimensionality of the movement using principal components analysis. And uh, again, a couple of examples. This is the least happy example. <laughs> And the most happy. Okay, so there's more rotation and uh, higher dimensionality of, of movement. <coughs> uh, okay, we we also did uh, we d derived. Um, an emotional feature that we uh, termed circular circular effect. Uh, it, we, it was basically um, we took the valence and ac activity or arousal ratings um, that are the, the two dimensions in the uh, dimensional model of emotions and uh, <coughs> projected uh, the valence activity vector onto. Um, onto uh, unit vectors that had various uh, polar angles. So, like for instance, here's a, a valence and activity ratings for one stimulus. So the, <coughs> the circular effect for the angle theta was this much, whereas for another stimulus it was that much. So, uh, and this was done for all, all possible polar, polar angles. And what we... Um, obtained from this was, was a, a graph that shows how, how these different kinematic features are related to the, to the um, directions in the emotional space. So for instance, um, fluidity, uh, high, high fluidity tended to be uh, in this direction, so if the valence and arousal uh, uh, values were uh, like uh, in this direction, then the dancers tended to show high fluidity. And uh, so if we, if we uh, compare this dimensional model with the, with the basic emotions, they are usually like this at, at the basic quadrant. So like, like high fluidity corresponds not to the to tender um, emotion, and whereas then for happy emotion we have these acceleration-related uh, features, for instance, that show um, high values. Okay. Okay. Moving on uh, from musical characteristics to to listener characteristics. Um, well, um, it has been found that the biological mo motion contains information about uh, the personality of, of a person, the mood and the gender. This has been studied uh, mostly with uh, walking, the gait. And um, actually I wanted to show the Biomotion Lab demo, but I don't have the internet connection. But it's, it's uh, I'm sure many of you know that. So it's, it's uh, like a modeled uh, gate where you can adjust different parameters related to emotion and gender and so on. So it has been modeled uh, quite convincingly, actually. Um, so overall, it has been found that body motions are reliable indication, indicators of personality type. We can uh, infer the personality, for instance, from, from the movements of a speaker quite uh, reliably. And uh, some personality disorders uh, are also reflected in, in uh, bodily movement. Now, we were interested in um, whether these kind of uh, correlations exist in music-induced in movement. And uh, the first uh, question we studied was, was personality. And so we carried out the big five personality uh, test on our uh, 
movers, and that uh, inventory, it, it measures uh, personality along these uh, five main scales. And again, we, we compared the movement kinematics with the personality traits. <coughs> And uh, so, let me just show a couple of examples again. So there are the five uh, personality um, dimensions. And I wonder if you can tell the personality of these two movers from this. Uh, <laughs> That's again a, a very evident example, just to make the point. <laughs> Nothing very surprising here, I would say. Okay. Another one, uh, the hand flux, the, the amount of movement in the hands. Again, two, two dancers. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, personality trait is something uh, very permanent, so it stays um, pretty constant during our lifespan. Mood is something that fluctuates more, and uh, now it has been found that that uh, again. Mood can be uh, can reflect like uh, sorry like movement can can reflect uh, emotional states or moods and uh, well instrumentalists ex expressive body movements can convey basic emotions <laughs> and uh, like the expressive content can be can be uh, conveyed by dancers uh, via via gestures. Uh, now, as regards our participants, what we also did was, uh, okay, again, we used a, a new set of, of uh, kinematic features here. We used the positive affect, negative as affect scale to, to uh, measure the uh, effect after the Experiment whether we're, whether they were in positive mood or negative mood and uh, to what extent and again compared uh, the kinematics of the movement with the effect and um, <clears throat> okay again now you should uh, tell which of these dancers are in positive mood which are in negative mood. And uh, here are some of the uh, kinematic features that were like the best predictors of, of, of mood. So kinetic energy was the, the, the best predictor of all of them. <coughs> okay. Uh, moving on from a kinematic analysis to more to perceptual side, uh, like, uh, like we were interested in, in how we perceive, can we perceive skill or attractiveness from like this kind of point like this place and what kind of connection do they have uh, to the kinematic properties of the movement. Uh, now, uh, of course, music induced movement and dance is something uh, quite important, like for instance, uh, like a, a way to communicate with uh, 
with the opposite sex, for instance, and, and so it's 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 uh, something uh, uh, important for social interaction. So, so related to this issue, we we first uh, investigated um, whether gender can be um, recognized or predicted from the kinematic properties of music-induced movement. That has been uh, found in, in gate uh, analysis that, uh, that for instance, uh, for instance uh, uh, gate kinematics have, have been found to predict uh, gender with a very high accuracy. Um, of course, uh, gate is something uh, much simpler than, than music-induced movement, so, so we probably would not expect such a high accuracy here. Um, also, it, it, it been ha has been found that uh, kinematic features can predict uh, women's perception of men's dancing ability, and uh, especially, especially the right knee, for some reason, <laughs> <laughs> has been found to could be a good predictor. Uh, I don't know why it's the right knee, <laughs> and not the left one, but that's what, what they found in that study. Uh, Okay, so uh, okay, we we uh, we built a gender classifier from uh, kinematic variables. So so we took uh, forty eight of of these uh, movement recordings, uh, extracted a large amount of movement features. Then we used uh, Elimin feature elimination uh, with cross validation to to uh, to uh, find an optimal subset of, of these kinematic features that would in the best possible way predict gender from the movement and that could do it so that it could uh, um, uh, generalize to unseen instances so that's why why we used cross validation so we trained the classifier with one set of, of kinematic data and then tested it with another set of kinematic data and uh, well what you see here is is like the classification accuracy as the number of uh, kinematic features uh, retained in the model and the upper curve shows the non cross validated uh, classification accuracy which uh, i mean it it uh, gets higher and higher because it overfits so that's uh, that's not a good measure but the lower curve is is the cross validated was cross-validated um, classification accuracy, and you you can see this uh, optimal point uh, with five features has a, an eighty percent accuracy. When we take five best features, and um, those are the five most unique discriminating features, and uh, so these are the features that uh, discriminated the genders uh, in our our data. So the best discriminating feature was the wiggle of hips that we uh, defined as the mean absolute angular velocity of hips around the anteroposterior axis. So it, it has the highest discrimi discriminative power. And then there was distances of hand, anteroposterior speed of feet, bounding rectangular, which is kind of the area of movement, and uh, acceler anteroposterior acceleration of head. So, so those, those features uh, put together using that magic formula up there, provided a classi classifier that correctly class class classified 80% uh, of the cases. <clears throat> and just to give you an idea, uh, now if we take uh, like uh, the most female of all <laughs> dancers, uh, according to this uh, gender index, then this is how it looks. Look at the hips. <laughs> okay, then uh, at the other side of the spectrum, so the most masculine male dancer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
then uh, let's have a look at the misclassified case. So it's like the uh, female who was classified as most masculine. And then, of course, the, the most feminine male is here. Okay, okay. Let's move on now to the actual perceptual uh, experiments. So, so we had uh, heterosexual participants, uh, 62 of them, and uh, they were asked to rate uh, the point light displays um, on 10 uh, different scales. So, the first four uh, were related to how, how they perceive the dance moves themselves. The next four were related to how, how they perceive the dance based on, on the moves. And uh, uh, the, the last two ones were about uh, the future behavior of, of, uh, of the participants. And um, let me just show... Uh, actually, the, the rating scales correlated quite highly, so... So they kind of, uh, it seems that uh, people used similar strategies for, for all of them, which was uh, a bit um, surprising, actually. But uh, let's take just um, three examples, dance, skill, sensuality, and interestingness. And now, starting with uh, women rating men. Now, the, the, the gender index uh, obtained from the classifier that I explained before was a very good predictor of, of, uh, of women's, uh, perception of, uh, women's perception of dance skill, sensuality and interestingness. But most interestingly, the, the, uh, the correlation was so that uh, if the gender index uh, classified the dancer as uh, very feminine, then uh, the women uh, rated the dance skill, sensuality and interestingness uh, high. So it was kind of opposite from uh, what, was, uh, what we expected. Now, if we look at uh, individual um, um, kinematic features, like what, what were the best kinematic features that uh, correlated most highly with, with those uh, uh, three uh, rating scales? So we have like uh, vertical speed, body sway uh, coming up there with uh, relatively high, high correlations, I would say. Now, if we look at uh, the other way around, men rating uh, the women dancers, the gender index could not predict anything. It was, it was entirely uh, non-significant correlations for some reason. Whereas if we look at the uh, movement variables, it's like uh, hips don't lie here, I guess. It's, it's all about <laughs> hips, uh, the relatively high, high correlations. Okay. <clears throat> Well, I guess I'm about to come to the end of my story. So just to conclude briefly, so what we have found is there are some regular patterns in the embodiments of musical meter. Certain musical characteristics, especially pulse clarity and spectral fluctuation, can predict kinematics of music-induced movement. Personality traits can be predicted to some accuracy from the kinematics as can be uh, mood, positive, negative, affect. Um, <clears throat> gender can be classified from, from uh, the kinematics with around 80% accuracy. And it seems that uh, perception of men's music in this movement can be predicted from the kinematics better than women's for some reason. We still have to investigate this a bit more. 
I would like to thank some of my wonderful team members, especially Mark, who is from McGill. He uh, obtained his bachelor's from here, and next week he will defend his PhD thesis on music and movement. So best luck for him. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.